Now let's open our Bibles at John chapter 12 and at the fairly lengthy passage which we read together earlier in our service. Many people divide the Gospel of John into two parts, as you may probably know. Chapters 1 to 12, they would call the book of the signs. We have noticed how many signs Jesus performs which are intended to convey something of the revelation of his person and work. And then, in the second half of the book from chapter 13 to the end, they would describe that as the book of the passion. As I was saying last Sunday evening, that particular section deals with something like the last week in the life of Jesus. Now, this evening we come to that section of John chapter 12, which in a sense is a climax of the first part of the gospel and a bridge into the second part of the gospel. It sets before us our Lord Jesus Christ in a particular role. He comes to us here in three particular focuses. The first, in verses 12 to 19, he appears as the coming king. The famous story of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Then from verse 20 to around verse 33, he appears as Jesus the dying seed, introduced by the arrival of some Greeks who came to Philip and asked, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And Jesus begins to enlarge upon the theme of his death to them. And then finally, from around verse 34, where the crowd begin to respond to Jesus, and Jesus diagnoses the real nature of their response, the theme is Jesus, the rejected Savior. So you have these three themes which lead us into the week of Jesus' passion and suffering and ultimately his death and resurrection. First, Jesus, the coming king. Then, Jesus, the dying seed. And thirdly, Jesus, the rejected Savior. And it is with this particular passage that the first part of John's Gospel draws to a conclusion and leads us directly in to the second part of the gospel, which deals particularly with his death in detail. I want us to look at these three areas this evening. First of all, at the picture that we have of Jesus as the coming king. You'll be familiar with this story of how the great crowd that had come up to the feast of the Passover came out from Jerusalem, and probably they were largely the visitors who had been in various places where Jesus had performed some of these remarkable signs and wonders, and they were in the city and had word that Jesus was approaching. And so they come out in great numbers, probably very much larger than we might imagine, from the city of Jerusalem, and they come to greet Jesus. They immediately take, in verse 13, palm branches, which were, for them, flags that they were waving, a mode of greeting Jesus, and they go out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King 
of Israel. And then Jesus begins to make his way in to Jerusalem. There is a profound sense, of course, in which they were right in their acclamation as they cried out, Hosanna or save now. They were using messianic language, language which from the Old Testament was an expression of how the Messiah would come. He is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. He is the King of Israel. And then Jesus does an extraordinary thing. Undoubtedly, these people were going out to welcome him in as the king that they longed for. You will remember that at various times during these previous chapters of John's gospel, they had longed to make him a king. They looked to Jesus and expected that they would find in him the one who would set them free from the yoke of Rome. And so they went out on this particular day, having heard of his triumph over death in Lazarus' experience, and doubtless recognizing that someone who could thus triumph over the last enemy would be able to triumph over even the powers of Rome. And so they go out to greet him. And Jesus finds a young donkey and sat upon it in order to fulfill the scripture which is written in Zechariah chapter 9 and we know it better from its appearance in the Messiah rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion behold your king comes unto you now that of course is a messianic prophecy but if you read it in Zechariah chapter 9 you will discover that what the prophet is describing is the coming of a king who is righteous and having salvation but is gentle riding on a donkey on a colt to the foal of a donkey and in the most amazing and mysterious way the Messiah is going to be a king but he is a king with a difference. He is a king who is riding not on some great powerful charger or at the head of some mighty army or with his minions around him preparing the way for his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem there to banish the power of Rome and sit upon the throne of David and bring the Jewish nation into the time for which they had longed. Instead, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey the symbol of the King of Peace. And when he arrives in Jerusalem, he does not reign over it. If you know the other Gospels, you will know he weeps over it and cries, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But he is coming as a king although not the king that they wanted to make him. He was coming to conquer, but not in the way that they expected. Do you remember how Pilate was puzzled by this title that was written over his cross ultimately? He said to him, are you a king then? And Jesus said to him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. But my kingdom is from another world. And of course that spoke to people like Pilate of weakness. And it tends to speak in worldly terms to people who do not think in 
biblical and God-centered terms of weakness. Jesus riding in a donkey into Jerusalem. The thing seems pathetic with these people waving their branches and crying, Hosanna. It's almost a comedy figure to the world. But when Pilate began to examine Jesus, I wonder if you remember how he began to speak to him about the power and authority that belonged to him, against which Pilate had no power, even though he was the representative of the whole of Rome. He said to him, Do you not know, said Pilate, that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus said, Do you not know that you would have no power over me except it were given to you by God. And as he rode into Jerusalem, these people were to learn that his kingdom was not of this world. He was going to stoop to conquer. And as he came to the cross, ultimately, of which he is going to speak presently to the Greeks, they would discover that by his death, he was going to gain a kingdom which would reach beyond the boundaries of Rome and make them appear paltry and narrow, so that this evening even, The kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ are in every corner of the world. And one day, before him, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. For this journey into Jerusalem as the king with a difference was a journey which in a sense was but preparatory for the day when he would come not just to Jerusalem but into the world with power and great glory and when every eye would see him and the whole creation would bow down before him King of kings and Lord of lords. So John gives us a glimpse of Jesus, the coming king. And the Pharisees were greatly disturbed. Do you notice in verse 19? They said one to another, See this, that is this policy we have had towards him is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And it must have looked like that. This great crowd who were following him. Now, that leads us into the next section of the chapter where we read about Jesus as the dying seed. Because... People came to Jesus in verse 20 who were representatives of the Gentiles, the world outside the confines of the Jewish nation. And that's the significance of these Greeks who came to Jesus. In a sense, the whole world was beginning to go after him. These Greeks who came up to worship at the feast, who were probably amongst the Gentile God-fearers who were found in the court of the Gentiles outside the temple, they came to Philip and they requested him, Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Now, it's very interesting that Jesus does not come to them simply to reveal himself to their curiosity. What Jesus does is to begin to speak about his coming death. 
in the form of a parable, the parable of the dying seed. Notice it in verse 23. And we know immediately that it is about his death that he is going to speak because he says now in verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, many times previously in John's Gospel, Jesus has been saying right from chapter 2 at the wedding of Cana onwards, the hour has not yet come. When his mother asks him, they have no wine, he says, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And again and again he says something similar to this at various crises in his life and ministry. The hour has not yet come. My time is not yet. And constantly he is speaking about this particular hour, which he now says in verse 23, has arrived or come the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now here is Jesus taking us further into this whole realm of how he is going to be the Savior of men and women. I tell you the truth, verse 24, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, that parable is Jesus' picture of the necessity of his coming death. You will notice that not only the multitude around him, but even his disciples himself had not wanted to listen to Jesus when he spoke to them about his coming death on the cross, his suffering, his sin-bearing, and then his resurrection. But now he says there is a principle here, which is the principle of bringing life, of producing the harvest that he has come into the world to bring, of a multitude of people who would become the people of God. How is he going to produce this harvest? Jesus' answer is, the way it happens in nature is the way it will happen in grace. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, the principle is very obvious. It is that the seed which falls into the ground gives up its own life. Out of its husk, new life bursts and appears. Many seeds come and ultimately there is a great harvest. Now Jesus says the principle is that the Son of Man will have to give up his life in death in order that the harvest of the gospel may be reaped in the lives of people like these, these Greeks, that is. Now do you notice how he then applies that in verse 25, not only to himself but to others? The same principle, the man who loves his life will lose it while the man who hates his life, which of course is a comparative term and means gives it up or gives it away in this world, will keep it for life eternal. Now what is Jesus saying? Well, he is saying what you want me to do is to hold on to my life. This be far from thee, Lord, they said to him when he told them about suffering and death and Calvary and all its pain and anguish and being a sin-bearer. This be far from thee. But Jesus says, unless I give up my life, it will produce nothing. It is in dying that fruit will be born from my life. 
Now we have seen, of course, how gloriously true that is. The necessity of his death in our place for our salvation is what Jesus is speaking about. But do you notice that here again, as so often, Jesus takes the same principle and applies it to us. It is not only the pattern for his dying as our Savior, it is the pattern for us living as his servants. Look at verse 25. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. Now, what is Jesus saying? He is saying that if you are going to be his servant, you need to live on this principle. What's the principle? Well, it's really very simple. If you try to hold on to your life, as it were, and keep it for yourself, if you refuse Jesus Christ and his call to come and deny yourself and abandon everything for the sake of Jesus, you will hold on to your life, but it will actually slip through your fingers. That's what will happen. If you come as these people did come to Jesus and refused and rejected him in all the fullness of his demand for discipleship, then they held on to their lives. They kept them. They did not experience the cost of giving everything over to Jesus, of losing their lives for his sake and the gospel's. They kept them, their own little plans, their own little treasure, everything that they had decided they were going to pour their life into and live for. My life is my own to do with it as I please. I've heard many Christians say that. And what happens is, you see, life actually disappears through their fingers like a liquid that they cannot hold on to. And the only way to find your life is to count it as nothing and give it to Jesus. See what he's saying? The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who refuses to do that who hates his life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. So there is a principle that applies to Jesus and also applies to his servants. You and I really do need to face that in a special way this evening. Now notice how Jesus goes on to describe to us what this death is going to mean to him. We would be accustomed to say that the story of Gethsemane doesn't occur in John's Gospel. And of course that's true in the strict sense. But I think that here in verse 27 we have John's equivalent of Gethsemane when Jesus says, Now my heart is troubled. The word really means something much more profound than it might suggest to us. It speaks of that deep sense of anguish and distress that runs all the way through every area of life. It is what Jesus is speaking about in Gethsemane when he says, My soul is troubled within me. Now, why is Jesus troubled? 
What shall I say, he says? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now, that's exactly the kind of thing that Jesus was facing in Gethsemane when he said, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that anguish in Gethsemane is the very thing that John is describing here. Why is Jesus' soul troubled? Not merely because he was facing death and physical hurt and pain, but because he was facing what it meant to become the sin-bearer as he looked out over Jerusalem and as he looked out over these people who were now surrounding him and realized that death on the cross was to mean that all the great burden of the sin of man was to come upon him and he was to bear it in his body on the tree, that he was to know what it was to experience the judgment of a holy God upon sin in him. He cries, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? And of course, he longed to be saved from this hour. Mine hour has come. And Jesus realizes something here of the full horror of it. But in verse 28, he says, Father, glorify your name. And then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd thought that it thundered. And Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Because now is the time when the prince of this world is to be cast out. He said this when he described his death as a being lifted up from the earth to show what kind of death he was going to die. So here is the picture of Jesus giving himself to be cast into the ground, as it were, to bear the sins of many, to be the object of the judgment of a holy God in order that he might set us free from it. But then finally John goes on to reveal to us the third picture of Jesus not only as the coming king and the dying seed, but Jesus as the rejected Savior. You get some of that from verse 34 when the crowd begin to debate with him. Who is the Son of Man, they say, who must be lifted up? We were told that the Christ will remain forever. And Jesus begins to describe to them from verse 35 the dangers of rejecting the Savior. It is, first of all, the danger of departing light and then the danger of a hardening heart. Notice how Jesus describes the first from verse 35. Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid them himself from them. Now, of course, we've come across before in John's Gospel this picture of Jesus as the light. But what he is speaking about here is the departure of the light. 
here they are, you see, having, as it were, basked in the light of Jesus for three years, many of them, because these were the people who had been all round Galilee during the time he had performed his signs. They had watched him, they had listened to him, and the light was there shining upon them. You see what's happening? They are rejecting the light. And Jesus says, put your trust in the light while you have it, so that you may become sons of light, because you only have it a little while longer. Now this is a note that you find frequently in Scripture when people are rejecting God and His voice and His Word. There comes a time, for example, in Israel's history where God withdraws His Word, where the day of grace for these people comes to an end. And here for these people, certainly it was true, when Jesus had finished speaking, he left and hid himself from them. So that so far as we know, this was his last public utterance to them. And one of the ways in which we can reject him is by this whole spirit of putting him off. You see, it's a really dangerous thing to do. I reckon that there are many people who have had special seasons of grace in their lives when God has been dealing with them and speaking to them and giving them peculiar opportunities. And these days they have treated lightly. They have regarded them cheaply, and they pass by. Now, I can only tell you I have watched this happen in people's lives. I've lived long enough to see people grow through various stages of maturity, and I have seen periods in people's lives when I've been aware that God has been graciously dealing with them and pleading with them and bringing the light to bear, as it were, upon their lives. And they have paid little heed. And to these people, Jesus says, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Just a little while longer. Do you notice the other thing that he turns to focus attention on from verse 37? And that is the whole principle of the hardening of the heart. I suppose it's linked with the departure of the light. The heart begins to become hardened. Jesus quotes from Isaiah, do you notice? Or perhaps it's John who quotes from it, from verse 53 and then from chapter 6 of Isaiah. And it, it speaks to us of how the eyes are blinded, the hearts are deadened, the people cannot hear or see nor turn to God. And the reason is that a process of hardening has taken place. Now, it's very interesting that John says in verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Because many of these people were in precisely that position. They were experiencing a hardening it's a very real thing. On this lovely sunny day, you know, if you had gone out into the garden this afternoon and you had put down two objects, one some ice cream and the other a piece of clay, the same sun would have beat down on both of them and you know exactly what would have happened to them one would have been melted down. 
and the other would have been baked hard. The same opportunities, the same grace of God, the same expression of his love and tenderness when the Son of Righteousness arises on us can do exactly these two things in two people alongside each other. One is melted before God into glad, willing love and obedience. The other is baked hard and becomes more and more impenetrable to the voice of God and to the touch of his hand. That's why Jesus says to them, walk while you have the light. Let me just point out to you as we close different ways in which others rejected the Savior. In verse 42, many among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I just wonder how long they went on, more afraid of men than of God. That's one way of rejecting the Savior. You notice how Jesus highlights another in verse 47. As for the person who hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge him. I did not come to judge the world but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. What's that judge? That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. Do you notice this different kind of rejection of Jesus? This is the rejection of Jesus by those who accept his words, who say, great, wonderful to hear his words. They hear it, they receive it, but they don't obey it. And Jesus says, there is a judge for the one who thus rejects me, and that judge will be the very word that I have spoken on the day when the King of glory comes in all his splendor. Do you know what he's saying here? What he's saying is this, the very word that you refuse to obey will sound in your ears as the judgment of God. So really the lesson that is to be learned from all of this is very simple. It is that the only wisdom in the whole world worth learning is that the place where I'm going to find real life is when I give it away to Jesus. And I'm ready for any cost for the sake of doing that. Paul, if he could have been in this pulpit this evening, would have been saying to us, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I regard them in fact as dung in order that I may win him. you learned the basic law of life yet? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ coming King, dying seed, rejected Savior. How we long that we ourselves, with every part of our being, may be his servants and follow him.
that we may hear his voice and obey it, and that we may give ourselves heart and soul and mind and strength to Jesus. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.